Well, I know that to get through the book of Acts, we're going to have to hit the ground running. And I thought that tonight we'll do something probably do a little bit more of, and that is kind of do an overview on certain subjects. And if you've got your handout, it's pretty obvious what our topic tonight will be, and it will take our entire class period, but we're going to look at an overview of the book of Acts when it comes to the issue of miracles. Now, I really thought long and hard about this. I want to keep a balance. I think one of the great challenges when you teach the Bible and when you preach it, you want to be precise, you want to be technical, you want to be theological, you do not want to handle the Word of God uh, dishonestly or deceitfully, and yet sometimes we can get so technical, and rightfully so, but sometimes we get so technical that we rob the average church member of the blessings that God has for you. Uh, so when I think of the topic of miracles, I think of what was said yesterday, since I knew I was speaking on this subject, I was listening intently for any kind of an illustration, that's what we do. And uh, our guest missionary, Courier, uh, taking the Bible, Bibles all over the world, and one of his last statements before he stepped down from the pulpit was, now I can't tell you everything because we're in some Iron Curtain countries, but if you want to hear about some of the yeah. miracles, you were listening. If you want to hear some of the miracles that are happening in Russia, I'll be glad to share those with you after church. Anybody ask me about some of the miracles in Russia? Okay. Now, I could have stood to my feet. Not my style, and my wife would slap me. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but don't you understand that miracles are not for our day? Now, what, do you, what would you think if I would have done that? You could have said, he's right, preach it, brother. Or you could say, come on in. <laughs> We'd say, sit down and let your wife slap you. Yeah. <laughs> or you could say, just relax, chill. Are we not allowed to use the word miracle the way he did? Yes. Absolutely. I would be really a disgrace to not only my wife, but to a lot of other people if I were to do that. And yet we also realize that as we look at the overview of the miracles in the book of Acts, we do have to be careful because there are very large groups and large denominations, televangelists, that would insist that miracles are still going on today. You can send your money in, get that miracle cloth that they'll send to you, and you'll be healed instantly. Right? All kinds of stuff going on. So in our minds, we think, wait a minute now, I want to keep the balance. On one hand, I know that theologically we need to be very careful how we define miracles. And yet on the other hand, is it not okay for me to say that I really need a miracle this week? I mean, is that okay? Yes, I, hope, I think you're with me. So here's my challenge tonight for all of us. We want to be precise, we want to be theological, we want to condemn those, I mean in a sense theologically, we want to say you are absolutely wrong if you are teaching and preaching that you could have a miracle a minute here in the 21st century. And yet also be able to say, are you trusting God for a miracle? I remember preaching chapel messages quite often just before Christmas vacation. And I would challenge the young people with this very simple question. What are you planning for the next five weeks over interterm that will absolutely take a miracle if you're going to see it fulfilled? It's amazing how they took that statement because they would share with me the miracles that they were hoping and praying for and how God answered. One came to me and said, it would be an absolute miracle if my dad would get saved over Christmas vacation." And that young man was able to come to me in January, at the end of January, and say, God worked the miracle. My dad was saved. I remember another college student coming to me and saying, <clears throat> I've got music that is not honoring to the Lord, 
It's hidden in my room at my house back home. And it will take an absolute miracle if I not, do not fall back into the trap of that worldly music. That young man, I remember coming back to me after Christmas vacation saying, God did a miracle. Somehow, some way, he gave me the strength with his help to get rid of that music. And my life has been changed over the Christmas holidays. So I'd love to challenge you with that very same question. What are you planning for the next month? Will absolutely take a miracle for it to happen. So there's nothing wrong with our using that word the way we do. And we all understand. But then also tonight, we're going to see we need to be very careful as we present what the Bible has to say about miracles. When do they happen? Why do they happen? Do they happen today? And what, how do we even define them when we talk about these things? I want to make it practical as I can tonight. Yes, we'll be theological. Yes, we're going to go through the points that I've got in the outline, but I also want to come down at the very end with our willingness to simply keep it simple. Uh, evidently, PCC is doing a lot of 50th stuff, and they had uh, some Facebook. I've never seen it. I don't really get into that. But they asked students from all over the past 50 years to share an aha moment. I guess you know what that means. <laughs> Something that really happened that changed their life, I guess. And so I did not see this. Alex Fulfer his brother's missionary in the Philippines. I think he spoke here a couple months ago. Alex sent me this text of somebody who wrote in and shared their aha moment. Now, I know when I read this, I'm going to be accused of, you know, tooting my own horn, having a bragamony, but think of it the way I do. I preached the message that's referred to in this text 35 years ago. This is the first person in 35 years who's ever said out of 4,000, they got anything out of the message. <laughs> So just relax. <laughs> Here it is. I remember as a senior having seven job offers that I was excited and confused about. I was frustrated because when I asked for my parents' advice, they wouldn't give it to me. They said that that was between me and the Lord. Dr. Bear preached a message in chapel on determining God's will. He made it so simple for me. He said, if you don't feel God leading you in a certain direction, then stay where you are until you know God's direction. Brilliant, but simple. And again, it took me 35 years to get that, so just live with it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Settle down. But tonight, as we look into what can be a fairly technical topic, that is the miracles, as we see throughout the book of Acts, I also want to make it practical so it can meet our lives, meet us where we are. So I'm going to keep it simple and yet complex. All right, let's read one of the passages to get us started tonight. Acts chapter 3. I always like to start off by having somebody read a portion of what we're looking at. We're going to look at one of the miracles found in Acts chapter 3. Any volunteers tonight to read those first 11 verses? Acts 3 and verses 1 through 11. Sure, why not? All right, thank you, Andrew. 3, 1 through 11. Yes. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I known, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him up by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leapt up, leaped, and he leaping up stood, and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. 
All right, thank you. In our chart, we're just giving you a quick overview of most of the miracles that we find in the book of Acts. As Andrew just read, we have, first of all, that uh, Peter heals a, lay, a, lay, a layman, excuse me, in chapter 3, 1 to 11. We have Ananias and Sapphira struck dead. That's not your, one of your greatest miracles, but uh, especially for Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, true, true or false? They were struck dead because they did not give all their money. False. All right, good job. Why were they struck dead? Because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Good. Uh, the next one, apostles perform many wonders. Then we have Peter and John communicating the Holy Spirit. That's in Samaria in chapter 8. We have the angel directing Philip to evangelize the Ethiopian eunuch. That's in the Gaza Desert. Paul converted on the road to Damascus. We'll see that in probably a little bit starting next week. Peter heals Aeneas, raises Tabitha, delivered, was delivered out of prison. God kills Herod. Again, another miracle involving the death of an individual, uh, but well-deserved by Herod. And so on, you can go through the list. I've given, as far as I can tell, I believe I've got every one of them listed there as far as miracles in the book of Acts. Now, number one, the background. The background of biblical miracles. And again, I assume that perhaps you've heard some of this before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I want to make sure if you have not, that we give you a pretty good background on this very important subject. Uh, because if you've got any friends that are from a charismatic type background, they are going to tell you healing is for our day, miracles are for our day, and they're going to want to know why you do not believe that when the Bible clearly teaches so many miracles being performed. All right, so there are, first of all, background, three major miracle working eras. We first of all have Moses and Joshua. That is the first primary era where quite a few miracles were done, especially, for example, the plagues on the land of Egypt. Then our second would be the time of Elijah and Elisha. Both these two men performing many, many miracles, again, as we'll see the purpose of what God was going to do through them. And then Christ and the apostles was our third major miracle-working era. But... For just a few seconds, let's play devil's advocate and see if you can come up with some other times where miracles were done, perhaps not in the quantity that these were done. But let me just ask you, go away from Moses and Joshua and away from Elijah and Elisha and away from Christ and the apostles. Can you think of other times where what I've just said is broken as far as our other times things happen? Noah and the flood, all right? Not, not related to what we've just given you. What else? Good job. Thank you. Hezekiah. I mean, Hezekiah. Whether the sundial is going to go forward or backwards, right? Totally disjointed from these three major miracle working eras. What else? Sennacherib's arm didn't wake up overnight. <laughs> are, you, are you looking at my nose? <laughs> <laughs> That's a miracle. Said so a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sennacherib, thank you. I appreciate you reading my notes, yes. Very good. What else? Uh, creation, I don't know if somebody mentioned that. We're going to go with the flood, God's creation. Well, then, well, what's the difference? I mean, we've got to understand if we've got all these isolated cases of other miracles, then why make such a big deal about these three major eras? And the reason why we're going to make such a big deal about them is that w was giving us a signal that more scripture is coming. That's the whole point of where we're headed. The purpose of the miracle was to say, pay attention. I'm going to give you more Bible, more scriptures on the way. And we're confirming that through these signs and wonders. But as you've already said, or all you can think of other times, the creation, the flood, Hezekiah, fiery furnace. Uh, you didn't read far enough to get to that one, I guess. <laughs> there are other times. <laughs> other times. Where, so what's the difference? Well, of course, with creation, as we're going to see, it was God and God alone. And I think that would probably be more comparable to what we experience. 
It's not that God is using me to work a miracle in my life, but God and God alone is doing things for me and doing things for you that do not need you. There's no human instrumentality involved. We are simply the recipients of what God has for us. And that is exciting when God works in our lives that way. All right, so there are other times. So that means we need a definition. Here we go, number two. I've given it for you in the outline. A miracle is an extraordinary event wrought by God through human agency, an event that cannot be explained by natural forces. Miracles always are designed to authenticate the human instrument God has chosen to declare a specific revelation to those who witness the miracle. And I like what Augustus Strong says. He's been around a while. Well, he's with the Lord. But uh, one of the oldest books I have in my library, I suppose, is Strong. Here's what he says. A miracle is an event in nature so extraordinary in it itself and so co coinciding with the prophecy or command of a religious teacher or leader as fully to warrant the conviction on the part of those who witness it that God has wrought it with the design of certifying that this teacher or leader has been commissioned by him. That's a mouthful, but that's where we're headed. The idea of the miracles in Scripture are to authenticate, to confirm this is God's man with God's message. All right, that brings us to number three, the purpose of biblical miracles. Small a, miracles introduced new eras of revelation. For Moses and Joshua, we have the law. Elijah and Elisha, we have the prophets. Christ and the apostles, we have the New Testament. Small b, miracles authenticated the messengers of revelation. 1 Kings 17, 23 to 24. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is truth. So here we have the idea they're connecting in 1 Kings 17 the miracles that you've done proves that you are the man of God and it proves that you are the man of God with the message of God. So we always have to be connecting the dots. The man gives us the message. The miracle shows he's the man from God with God's message to us. John 10, 24 and 25. If thou be Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. What I have done is the confirmation, the guarantee that I'm from God, God's man with God's message. Acts 2.22, that was at the end or in the middle of the chapter we looked at a couple weeks ago. Acts 2.22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Jesus, a man approved. How was he approved of God? By miracles and wonders and signs. That's the confirmation. That's the approval that God gives to the human being that this message is from God. Acts 14, verse 3. Long time therefore abode they, that is Paul and Barnabas, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, giving testimony unto the word. How? By the signs and wonders. All right, small c. Miracles authenticated the apostles of the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 12:12. 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, 
and wonders and mighty deeds. The signs are connected with the apostles. How could you have the sign of an apostle if somebody else can do it? How does that prove this individual is an apostle if everybody can do these signs? And of course, we're going to get to this in just a few minutes because everything I say in the first half of our time together, the charismatics would believe exactly what I've said. So I have no problem with that. The only difference is I believe we've got apostles today and they work miracles today and we have new revelation today. So this first half, they're going to all say, preach it, brother. You got it right. You got to have apostles and to have apostles, then you have the word of God and you have the word of God. It's authenticated by miracles. I'm right with you. So we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. We've got to have this confirmation of the apostles and their word by means of miracles. But then we also have to know how to shut this thing down. That those things are not for our day. So just hang in there. We'll get there in just a minute. All right, small d. Miracles called attention to new revelation. Miracles called attention to new revelation. For Moses, when he worked the miracles, it confirmed that the law, the Pentateuch, is on the way. Uh, Joshua gave us the beginning of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, that section, the historical books of the Old Testament. Elijah and Elisha bring us the prophets and all the message that comes from them. And then we have 1 Kings 18, 38 to 39. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. So what was it? They saw the miracle. They saw the consumption of the sacrifice by the fire from God. And they, as a result, fall on their face and they connect the dots, this must be from God. B.B. Warfield. Miracles do not appear on the pages of Scripture vagrantly, here, there, and elsewhere, indifferently, without assignable reason. They belong to revelation periods and appear only when God is speaking to his people through accredited messengers, declaring his gracious purposes. Their abundant display in the apostolic church is the mark of the richness of the apostolic age in Revelation. And when this Revelation period closed, the period of miracle working had passed by also as a mere matter, of course. When Stephen preaches his message in Acts chapter 7, he connects the dots in verses 36 to 38, and he connects Moses and those miracles with the lively oracles, that is the Torah, given to Moses in the Old Testament. One of the best passages, the one pastor went over a few weeks ago when we were back in Hebrews, before we got to Easter. But a fantastic passage. Don't miss this. I know it's stressing in the passage is more on the don't neglect it and what that meant. But here is a great passage in Hebrews 2, 2 and 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, how? Both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now I better get through the second half of this lesson because what I've given you up to this point will be agreed upon by just about any televangelist who has a healing ministry the way I just explained it. So it's got to be more than this. We can't just say, well, if you've got an apostle, then you're going to have some miracles, and that shows new revelation. And again, so many will say, well, yeah, that's why we got miracles today. Miracles today are showing us we've got apostles today. Apostles today are showing us we've got brand new revelation today. You better be paying attention to all these great truths that are available to us today. So we've only gotten halfway. We've got to do something. 
That gives, brings us to small e. Miracles ceased with the apostles, the New Testament, and the founding of the New Testament church. And that's the key. So let me say it again. Miracles ceased, that is miracles where it is God working through human agency. And that's why I'm going to define it that way all the way through the rest of our course. Again, can I have a miracle in my life? Absolutely. But I'm not the agent. I'm not the instrument. In fact, I am so faulty, I'm amazing, the Lord blesses me as much as he does. But there's a vast difference between a miracle where God uses a human agent and what God does in our lives on a daily basis as we ask him for the miracles that we need in our lives. Why can we be so insistent that miracles ceased with the apostles, the New Testament, and the founding of the New Testament church? Here we go. Apostles were chosen personally by Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 1 to 4. Now you might say, well, the exception is Matthias. We saw him as the one who took the place of Judas. But even in that, it appears that the casting of lots was God's way to put God's stamp of approval on the man who would take the place of Judas. And then, of course, it was Jesus Christ who meets Saul on the road to Damascus. And when Saul is converted to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apostles were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. That really limits when and where we can have an apostle. Apostles were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. When Paul, both there in chapter 9 and again in Galatians chapter 1 and 2, as well as Philippians chapter 3, when he proves his apostleship, he always refers back to the fact that he had the privilege of seeing the post-resurrected Christ as he saw him on the road to Damascus. Whether he saw him earlier, the Bible doesn't tell us. By best estimates, Paul was probably about the same age as Christ. That is, when Christ was crucified, Paul could have been anywhere from about 33 to 35, best estimates seem to be. So, at that age, he perhaps could have seen Christ, we're not told. But we do know in Acts chapter 9 that he saw him on the road to Damascus. Apostles had absolute authority, 1 Corinthians 14, 29 to 33. Apostles were authenticated by miraculous signs. In Acts 3, 5, 9, 20, and 28, I've just given you the chapters. Most of them you can refer back to our chart at the beginning of the outline. The church was founded upon the apostles, Ephesians 2, 20. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. And apostles have an eternal and unique place of honor, Revelation 21, 14. Revelation 21, 14. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, I'll let you decide who got left out because we I count 13. You got the 11. Judas is off the scene. He's not included. You got Matthias, who's voted to take the place of Judas, and then you've got Paul. My guess is Matthias, but I can't imagine Paul would be left out. But anyway, you can decide that and Argue over yourself in the next session. <laughs> but what I want to get back to is something that I think is very critical and yet brings up a little bit of controversy. The church was founded upon the apostles. So wait a minute, I, I, I like that song, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ the Lord. What do you mean these apostles? Apostles. It almost seems like blasphemy to even, you know, even suggest that the church was founded on the apostles. One, what makes it even more challenging is probably how you interpret Matthew 16. When Christ asks, who do men say that I am? And Peter gives his confession, and then Christ says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. 
Now, I know it's very popular because the Roman Catholics have stolen that verse that we, we want to teach any kind of interpretation other than that Peter's the rock, even though it's the most natural way to take that passage. Why well, would even mention his name, thou art Peter, if it doesn't have anything to do with what follows? I don't think we can let the Catholic Church, you know, threaten us with a belief that may be just taking it simply. I think I mentioned this a few years ago. When I taught a systematic theology class one summer, I had students from Japan, South Korea, Lebanon, mainland China. One Chinese pastor had come to the United States, was, was pastoring a, a Chinese church in Pennsylvania. So I asked her one day, I knew what I was getting to this passage, that is the Matthew 16. <clears throat> so I asked them to bring their translation to the class. And I said, now I'm going to have to trust you to translate it freely for me because I don't have time to be learning Chinese and Japanese and Korean and Lebanese and whatever. So they did that. They thought that was pretty interesting. And when I got to Matthew 16 and talking about the controversy of that passage, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And, of course, you can read in Schofield that idea that he's talking about, although he says, thou art Peter, then he's pointing to himself. Christ is the builder. What's more important, the builder or the rock? Well, it's got to be the builder in that particular context. But anyway, as I asked them to go around the room and read it in their translation, and then, for the sake of us who don't understand your native tongue, Translate it for us. And to a person, it came out something like this. Thou art the rock upon which I'll build my church. Or you're the one I'm going to build my church on. Or something to that effect. And I thought, they don't even have the controversy. No wonder they're looking at me cross-eyed. <laughs> they're thinking, what are you talking about? What's the problem? There it is right in our passage. You are the one upon which I'll build my church. I think we need to understand a couple things, whether you believe that Peter's the rock or that Christ is the rock or his testimony is the rock. I do think a few things need to be cleared up. First of all, if you have something that symbolizes something in one passage, it doesn't mean that that is the symbol for the same thing throughout the scripture. Does that make sense? Let me give you some examples. What does the lion represent in scripture? Well, Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Therefore, once that symbol is established, every time we see the lion, it must be representing Jesus Christ. True or false? False. false. Yeah. The roaring lion, roar, going about seeking whom he may devour. Let me give you a try another one. Um, let's see. The lamb. What does the lamb represent in Scripture? Well, obviously, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, what else? John chapter 10, he's the good shepherd, who's the lamb? <laughs> you and I are the lambs. Uh, the rock we talked about. What about the morning star? What's the morning star represent in Scripture? It depends on what passage you're in. Yeah, Lucifer is actually the translation of star of the morning or day star. And Jesus Christ is called the bright and morning star in Revelation chapter 22. Ah, here's a good one. You know where I'm going now. You passed my quiz. Serpent. What does the serpent represent in Scripture? Healing. Serpent represents the devil, obviously. We know that. But the serpent also represents Christ. Jesus Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. So my point is, don't get so confined that if you see rock in Matthew 16, it has to be what rock is every place in Scripture. Now, the text we're using, the key passage, is Ephesians 2.20. And I think I have it there for you in the outline. The household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In that context the apostles are the foundation and Christ is the cornerstone is this a big deal I think it really helps our case if you'll stick with me here 
How many different foundations does this building have? How many foundations does the new church building have? This is kind of weird. As far as I know, one foundation. There's only one foundation to the church. So what some groups are teaching, if we still have apostles today, then we're saying there's more than one foundation. There cannot be. There is one and only one foundation, and that is built upon the apostles and prophets. Now, by the way, that word prophet there is not talking about Old Testament prophets. We see it in Ephesians all the way through Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. We see it in Ephesians 4, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, Unto his holy apostles and prophets. Evidently, he's talking about a group of men, prophets, that are c- coinciding with the apostles of the New Testament. So I would recommend to you, for what it's worth, that you have no problem with making the apostles the foundation of the church and Jesus Christ being the builder. Because once you establish that there is one and only one foundation, then that does away with the idea that we can have continual foundations being built over and over and over again. And we got layer upon layer upon layer of foundations because we have layer upon layer upon layer of apostles. Small f. Now let me make it practical in the few minutes we have left. Miracles today are more like the account of the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, do I believe in miracles today? Yes, I do. But I do not believe that I am the human agent by which miracles are performed. I'm not an apostle. That was done away. The completion of the New Testament, the ending of the apostles, there's only 12. I mean, just the number in Revelation 21 should be enough, right? How many apostles are the foundation? 12. We may not know which one got left out, but I know one thing for sure. That doesn't mean there's more of them out there coming this year or next year or the year after that. We're limited to the 12 because they were the foundation and you've only got one foundation. Now, as Andrew was reading in Acts 3, there's a word I'd never done a word study before on and I, it always just kind of jumped out the page at me. It's the word beautiful. I suppose the reason I never did a word study on beautiful because I figure I know what that means. Right? I mean, we better call our wives that on a regular basis. And don't try that line. Well, I told you that when we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Don't try that one. But we know what that word means. It means beautiful. But then I remember the verses that talk about in Romans chapter 10, how beautiful are the feet of those that published glad tithes. So I looked up the word. I thought, maybe there's something, a secret here. Maybe there's something I've never seen before. The word beautiful comes from the Greek word horais, where we got our word our, which makes absolutely no sense. And that's why I got curious. Wait a minute. The word beautiful is connected with the word our, H-O-U, our, R, <laughs> H-O-U-R. How in the world do those two connect? How could you have beautiful feet, and it talks about the hour, and then you have a beautiful gate, and it talks about the hour? It has the idea of being seasonal. It has the idea of being timely. It has the idea of blooming. And, of course, we look around, and we see all these azaleas. Mine are going crazy. I don't think I've ever seen the azaleas blooming like they are at our house. Now, what if they were like that year-round? It wouldn't be as beautiful. The idea is that one of the greatest miracles that God performs in our lives is beautiful because it is perfectly timed. Peter and John get to the temple exactly at the ninth hour, exactly at the time this lame man desperately needs healing. I see the timing in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. The timing is for no wonder the Bible calls the feet that publish the good news beautiful because God's timing is absolutely on time. It is absolutely perfect. The angel comes to Philip and says, get there and get there fast. And if you notice the passage sometime, read it for yourself. It says he ran to catch up with that chariot. 
Why you didn't? What if he would have been walking? If he would have just taken it easy and walked, he probably would have gotten there long after the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah 53. He would have probably been all the way up to chapter 58. He would have missed his opportunity. The timing is impeccable. And the more I read the book of Acts, and we're going to highlight that again before we get through, but what is so beautiful about the miracles that God brings into your life and my life is its perfect timing, exactly when I need it. And sometimes we don't recognize that. I, I think back to the many times that God brought a person into my life at the right time for me, or brought that person into my life so I could be a blessing to them. You know, we have all our schedules ready, and I remember just the other day, I was a little frustrated. I was behind schedule. I had five places I wanted to be, first the post office, then the UPS store, then here, and I had it all mapped out, but for some reason I forgot that in the middle of my itinerary, I was supposed to stop by Office Depot. I needed more paper for my printer for doing the taxes. And I somehow completely drove right by, and now I'm way out of where my path should be. I'm frustrated, but I turn around, spend about five, ten minutes getting back on track, go into Hobbs Depot, get that paper, get that ink for the printer, get in line, quickly going out the door. And as soon as I go out the door, I hear my name, Dr. Bear. And I turn around, I'm looking in the face of the person that I knew would take me at least two hours <laughs> to help them by going to their house, but I was able to take that two hours and was able to minister in five minutes. All because I thought, brilliant guy I am, I've got it all planned out, and God said, no, you don't. My timing is perfect. I'm going to get you the right place at the right time, outside Office Depot, not on your schedule, my schedule. If you'll just pay attention to me, I'm going to save you two hours. And I've seen God do that over and over and over again. So as I look through the book of Acts and I see these miracles, yes, the miracle that I can relate to is a miracle of the beautiful, of the perfect, seasonable, blooming timing that God brings into my life. He gets Lydia, for example. We're going to see that in Acts 16. God gets Lydia to the exact place at the right time. Lydia is from Thyatira. That's in Asia Minor. Remember in Acts 16, one of my favorite chapters in all the book of Acts? At the beginning of Acts 16, the Holy Spirit closes the door of preaching three times. Missia, no, sorry, you can't go there. Holy Spirit said no. Bithynia, sorry, can't go there. Troas, nope, can't do it. He leaves Asia Minor. The place where Thyatira, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor is located, goes all the way to Europe, to Philippi, and he finds Lydia. Where is she from? She's from Thyatira. And now we begin to see, well, that's why God got me going the wrong direction in my thinking. God took me from a place that I wanted to preach. God says no. Took me to the place he wanted me to be, because there I'm going to find somebody from Thyatira anyway. I'm going to give her family the gospel. And traditionally, we're told it was probably most of the time because of her family going back to their home that the church in Thyatira is begun. All in God's perfect time. How beautiful are the feet of those that publish glad tidings. I've seen it happen, and so have you. God's timing is always perfect. All right. Miracles, do they happen? Yes and no. <laughs> yes. They personally happen for us, but it's God and God alone who does it. The miracles of Scripture, the miracles of the New Testament, that was God working through human agency to put his stamp of approval on the early church, those apostles, and the Word of God. All right. I'll let you have a few minutes break before Dan takes over.